One of the biggest things that people regret, if that's what we're going to talk about, is um, not doing what they always wanted to do, putting it off, believing they have another year. You know, you sitting right here, you probably believe you're going to be here next year. So do I, right? We live our life believing that we have next year. And at some point, you don't. When I first started getting um, premonitions of people's death, and I would journal it um, from my team and spirit, I thought, oh, am I supposed to stop it? Am I supposed to, you know, tell the person and we, we shift it and change it? You know, I didn't know what that meant. Um, and it weighed heavily on me. And I have family members like my grandmother, uh, Grandma Sylvia. She said, if you ever get anything on me, you need to tell me. Well, I did get something on her. And I said, Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Shifting Dimensions podcast. I'm your host, Shumi Moses, and thank you guys so much for tuning in. On the show today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Helen Gretchen Jones. Gretchen is a certified death doula, intuitive, and channeler. She just released a new book, Healing Whispers from Spirit Guides, bridging the gap between life and the afterlife with a debt doula's wisdom. Her goal is to offer not just information, but profound understanding and practical tools that can help people find solace, meaning, and even beauty in the face of loss. Gretchen, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. It's such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yes. You know, one thing I love talking about on the show is the afterlife, because I feel like that's us kind of leaving the body and connecting with our spirit self and entering a different dimension and also kind of talking about what it means to be a human being having a spiritual experience right and I think a lot of your work definitely touches on all of these things so I'm excited to speak with you and I want to start off by asking you when did you discover the concept of end of life care and what made you decide to become a death doula so I would I believe that I first started serving the death, the dying community uh, after my father's death in 2015. I didn't become certified as a death doula until 2018 when I learned that was even a thing. Um, but I had already been working with the dying community uh, for a few years before I became a death doula. And um, it was my dad's death, which was relatively unexpected by the majority of the family that led me to kind of want to focus, I'd already had a connection with spirit, but kind of want to focus on um, how people can have a better death or a good death, as opposed to, uh, you know, our family didn't want to talk about it. Our family struggled with, we had a little bit of denial around his situation. And so I thought, wow, it would have been so healing if I had the tools back then to kind of aid the family through the process of, of his death. Yeah, I think that's how I got started. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. So you said that you had a connection with spirit, and I want to talk about that. Um, but for those who are listening, I don't want to assume that they know what a death doula is. So could you explain what a death doula is and, and what they do? Sure. So a death doula is a person who helps people transition. So we all know that the birth doula helps bring life into the world. A death doula helps someone exit the world, help them transition holistically. This used to be done a lot by nurses. And then when we had our big kind of changing, a lot of changes in our healthcare system, the nurses were required to fill out more paperwork and they were they have a lot more red tape surrounding their, their daily rounds. And so they don't have the time that they used to to really sit bedside with patients anymore, which I find actually was one of their favorite aspects of their job. And so now there's sort of a need for people to be available to those who are dying uh, to be able to sit where nurses aren't able to do that as much anymore. So that's what a death doula is. Yeah. And every time I hear someone talk about what it means to be a death doula, right? Because you said that nurse nurses typically handled this before in the past. And when I think about that, I just kind of think about the fact that they probably most often, and I could be wrong, handle the administrative stuff that comes with end of life care, right? Whether that's insurance and making sure things are, you know, properly assigned to someone else to take care of when their patient passes away. But when I talk to death doulas, it seems like there's that component to it, like the paperwork and all of that stuff, but also the spiritual component mm -hmm. of dying. So can you kind of talk about 
that piece of it? Like what, what is the, in addition to the more administrative stuff, like what, what are the components of end of life care on a practical level and also on a spiritual level? So uh, on a practical level, yes, we can help assist with not so much insurance. Um, that would be definitely a, a hospital or doctor nurse situation. Um, insurance does not cover death doula work at this time. If it did, then we'd be filling out a bunch of paperwork and going through the red tape and we'd be in the same situation as nurses. So um, hopefully it stays away from that for now um, for a little while. Uh, but on the spiritual side, a death doula is someone who's present, someone who is sitting with family, sitting with patients, uh, someone who is, we can fill out, we can help you fill out, do not resuscitate and those types of orders, but that's about it on the, on the paperwork side, but it is really more about being present. So people don't feel alone, uh, being versed in the dying process, what happens, the stages of death and, and, and what that looks like. So that as those stages start to happen, we can bring a greater understanding to those who are observing or witnessing it, or even going through it. Um, so it's just being familiar with the dying process, being present, being non-judgmental, being compassionate, and just really being available so people don't feel that they're alone in this process. So now I want to talk about your comment about having a connection with spirit prior to becoming a death doula. So can you talk about that a little bit? What was your connection with spirit? Did you have gifts? Did you have visions? You know, what was the extent of your connection to spirit? And when did it start? So my connection with spirit has been for as long as I can remember. I have always had spiritual experiences, even as a very little, little girl. However, as I started sort of acknowledging them and working with them and practicing, uh, they have definitely developed and, and gotten stronger over the years. Once I started working with the dying community, um, it sort of shifted a little bit. My connection with, I have a team in spirit. I call them a team. They're my helpers, my guides. Um, and once I started working with the dying community, a team, because I do regular meditations, really started pushing compassion, compassion as um, they wanted me to put myself in someone else's shoes, not to see what I would do different, not to see what I would change or how I would have, you know, reacted in their situation, but just simply to be in their shoes and try to feel what they're feeling. And it was that simple. So they've been pushing compassion for so long. Um, that as I started working with compassion and with people who are dying, another gift started to unfold. And this is what I'm kind of working with right now. And I, I love spirit. It changes, right? So we all, our gifts unfold as we do. Uh, right now, I'm sort of given a ballpark time when someone's going to transition. And um, having an idea of when someone's going to go, it could be literally years in advance, or it could be days in advance. And I journal these and I have a, I keep track of who I, what I've gotten on people and when they're going to be transitioning. Um, so I think as you start working with your gifts in a certain capacity and you're open to spirit coming through and guiding you with those gifts, I think different gifts will unfold based on where you're putting your energy because where we focus is where we are right now. I'm focused in the, in the dying community. So, yeah. And you know, you describe yourself as an intuitive and a channeler. And mm -hmm. I want to know what what the difference is between two of those things and, and what they are. My understanding of an intuitive, and I could be wrong, I think we're all intuitive to some extent, right? Some people are able to tap into their intuition a lot quicker than other people or recognize it a lot quicker. And it's stronger for certain people, but we all have that like hit or um, sense of knowing, right? I, that's what I call our intuition. And then channeling is like you're you're channeling another energy force. I could be simplifying it, but I just want to know, you know, what's the difference between being an intuitive and a channeler and do both of these gifts fit, feed into each other? Uh, yes and yes. I think, like you said, everyone is an intuitive to some degree. And uh, I also think everyone channels to some degree. If you think about in your life, a time where the words just came out effortlessly and you just kind of flowed in the moment and your words were really helpful and healing to someone and you can't really quite recall everything that you said, that would be sort of a channeling moment where you were guided through inspiration intuitively to 
speak words that would be helpful and hopeful and healing for someone. So I think that we all channel. And I also think that we also are all intuitive. And like you said, everyone can do it to some capacity. There's this uh, well-known medium, and I took one of her classes one time, and she described being able to connect to spirit, which would be in intuition or channeling, connecting to your higher self, that whole bubble of information, as being able to play the piano. Some people sit down and they play Beethoven. Some people sit down and they play chopsticks. You know, some people work for years to be able to play chopsticks. <laughs> some people, you know, and some people, you know, you can't, Maybe they don't even have hands, but they sit down and you can still play with other parts of your body. Everyone can connect to spirit in some form or fashion. It's just some people are going to be naturally more gifted at it. Some people have to work a little harder, but everyone can connect. So I think the difference between an intuitive and a channeler is I think the channeler is using words. Mm, although some people might would say, well, if I do a painting, I'm channeling creativity through that painting. So I guess you could also channel that way. There's not much of a difference, I suppose, but an intuitive is a knowing. It's this gut instinct and a channel is, I think, relaying a message based around that, that gut instinct. Okay. So an intuition is a knowing and then channeling is relaying a message based on that gut, gut instinct. And it could also be, I mean, I guess our intuition, it's, it could come from my higher self. It might come mm -hmm. from our spirit guides, the Holy Spirit, however you, you know, whatever jargon you subscribe to but I think is the relaying of that especially I guess if it's not just pertaining to you that then it's cha channeling because I feel like you could probably channel something I'm not saying you could but I'm saying some people could probably channel something for me where it's mm -hmm. like you get a message but it's not relating to you but you feel inspired to share something that could potentially help me right um yes. okay so all right. So I, I just wanted to ask that because I think that in the work that you do, like kind of going back to the piece about compassion, I think that's very interesting that you brought that up because obviously um, one thing I'm passionate about learning more about and talking about is this idea of empathy, right? And for some reason in my mind, when I think about empathy, it's almost synonymous to compassion and I don't know if that's accurate, right? But again, going back to compassion and how it relates to your work, you said something about spirit kind of pushing you to understand how people feel rather than thinking for yourself, oh, you would have done something differently. Like you're literally stepping into their shoes. What's the significance of that? Like, why is there so much power in that? Why do you think spirit thinks that think, why do you think spirit thinks that's important? Um, my team in spirit, um, and see, that's my my jargon, um, a team, the reason that they find it to be really, really important um, is just on a human, just being human on a human collective level, we are very judgmental. And we are born to be that way, because we have to fit in, we have to survive, we have to take, you know, note of our family what they like, what they don't like, our family cultures. And then we have to mold ourselves to fit in just to be able to survive. And then when we move into our teenage years and early adult years, we start trying to figure out who we are separate from our families. And because we've gotten ourselves so, you know, in that vein of looking at someone, judging their actions, you know, learning to reason, all that stuff, it all becomes from a very self-centered place just to survive. It, it's It's just part of being human. But once we start stepping into someone else's shoes, uh, which is not easy, it's uncomfortable sometimes because we want to figure out what we would do to fix it or change it um, or to make it better according to us, you know, which is also self-centered, uh, <laughs> which is fine. Okay. But whenever you're starting to work with other people, um, then you need to not, you have to step outside of what your personal thoughts and judgments are and what you would do. And you have to connect with that person right where they are because right where they are is right where they're supposed to be and it's perfect so if you can relate to them in that way and connect to them on that way without trying to change them or fix them then you are blending with them in a way that is so divine and so beautiful and there is no judgment in that space and so compassion is important just to connect with another human being being judgment free and it is hard to do that sometimes initially because we've been trained to be self-centered since we're born. 
And so to step out of that, it takes a little bit of time and it takes practice. You know, I would assume that part of what you do, and let me know if this is part of what you do, right? When people are getting prepared to transition, right? Obviously they come to you and all of that stuff. Do you talk to them about past hurts, um, things that they're not able to release? Because when you're talking about compassion, right? Especially in the work that you do, I'm assuming you probably have to exercise that almost every single time when you're interacting with, you know, a, a client, right? So what are some of the things that people struggle with the most when they realize that their life is, you know, coming to an end and how, how are you able to help them work through that? Is that through you being compassionate and meeting them where they are so that they can release whatever they, they're still holding on to? Uh, yes, that's part of it. So um, an example might would be, uh, I had a patient who I call Mr. Robinson and <clears throat> something he was holding on to even in his eighties um, was that he felt he had lived his life based on how he thought others wanted him to live his life, which would have been typical of the 1950s, quite frankly. So he was in line with where our society was at the time, but here, as he was starting with the process, process of his terminal, terminal diagnosis, he started thinking about all the things he really wanted to do, but didn't allow himself to do it because it didn't follow social norms or it didn't fit what he thought others wanted from him. And he regretted that. And he had also figured out in that time that he had taught that behavior to his children. He taught them, no, 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 you know, your reputation's important or, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. What would people think? Um, and so right here at the end, I would start to kind of talk to him a little bit about it. I would say, you know, so if that bothers you, you know, maybe you need to talk to your kids a little bit, maybe bring them in. And he would brush me off. Usually, actually, he would fake, he would fake fall asleep and that would end the conversation. That's what he did all the time. He would fake narcolepsy and he would be out. And that was like, <laughs> we're not, we're not going to talk about it anymore. But I guess I wore him down a little bit because um, one day I walked in and he was asleep and his daughter was in there crying. And she said, I just had the most amazing conversation with my dad. Um, he told me that I was a good mother. He told me not to worry about what other people think. He told me all these beautiful things. I have it in the book, but um after she left, I tried, I, I was suspected that Mr. Robinson was not really asleep. I think he faked it to get out of the conversation with his daughter as well, because it was really hard for him to be vulnerable. And he told me that he goes, there's no way I can ever tell my family that they would think I'm weak. I'm like, what have you got to lose? You're not going to be here much longer anyway. That's hard news to hear sometimes. But um, I think when he thought, well, I'm going to be dying anyway, I might as well just get it off my chest. And when he did that, it she broke down in tears. She allowed herself to be vulnerable. And when people are vulnerable and they allow others to be vulnerable too, everyone opens up and every there's like this weight that's that's released. And really, if you're the patient who's dying, what do you have to lose? There's nothing. I love that. So, you know, I don't know if you've written down, um, I don't know if you've written this down, but I'm curious to know, in your work, right, over the years as a debt doula, what is one of the most common realizations that people arrive at before they transition about life? I do journal all of this stuff, actually. <laughs> so every time I meet with a patient, I go home and journal my experience. Um, so one of the biggest things that people regret, if that's what we're going to talk about, is um, not doing what they always wanted to do, putting it off, believing they have another year. You know, you sitting right here, you probably believe you're going to be here next year. So do I, right? We live our life believing that we have next year. And at some point you don't. And if you keep putting off everything you've ever wanted to do or something that's important to you, that's going to make a difference to you or your loved ones, or even this world in some small way, do it. What have you got to lose? That is what I learn over and over from the bedside of my patients. Another thing that I learned from the from from working with dying patients is they are so terrified often of being a burden. And if families could know in advance that they can 
release, help them release that fear of being a burden and to not call it, you know, burdensome, but to call it um, accepting of love, accepting of care. And I have journaled this and I haven't quite, <laughs> I haven't drawn a conclusion from it yet, but it has been my experience so far of my patients that people who have long terminal illnesses, not my short term ones, but my long term illnesses are people who never allowed themselves to be loved. They may have been super generous with their love or kind of a curmudgeon, but either way, they didn't allow themselves to receive it. And I don't know yet. I'm just journaling it. It's just an ongoing experiment, but sort of a terminal illness forces you to stop and forces you to receive love and care. And you you have to surrender to it. You can't stop it. So I wonder sometimes if the soul needs to feel that love, if a terminal illness is in the soul's highest and greatest good so that they can learn to receive. I don't know yet. Don't quote me on that, but that's just what my journals are revealing at this time. Incredible. You know, there's a book that I, you know, read recently. It's called The Myth of Normal by Dr. Gabor, Gabor Mate. And really the book, talks about how a lot of illnesses are linked to our emotional state and we don't really pay attention to that as often as we need to a lot of terminal illnesses come from you know he had several examples in the book where a lot of people struggled with saying no right they would always say mm -hmm. yes to everything they'd work themselves you know almost to death and they would be giving, 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 giving. And on the outside, it looked like they had this beautiful life, but they never said no. They never stood up for themselves. They tended to bypass a lot of their emotional struggles. And then eventually that would manifest as some sort of autoimmune disorder. And they're just like, what's happening, right? Um, so it's very interesting that you, you know, you're saying what you're saying. You know, we're not going to quote you, but <laughs> I would not be surprised if that in fact was the case. So thank you for sharing that uh, common realization. Outside of that, are a lot of people scared to transition outside of feeling like they're a burden to their family? Are they afraid of what's awaiting them on the other side? Or are they kind of apprehensive of the unknown that they're about to venture into? Or are they feeling more at rest and calm and accepting of transitioning? Okay, so both. So in the months and weeks leading up to their uh, death, their physical death, uh, they are oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes they are scared and nervous about the unknown. What does that look like? Is it going to hurt? Am I going to be uncomfortable is this it? This is, is this really a final goodbye? You know, all of these, you know, fears. Yes. However, when a person starts the actively dying process and we start moving into the days before they take their final breath, um, they start to, in my experience so far, have experiences with uh, spirit beings, deceased loved ones, angels, light, beings of light. I mean, all sorts of, um, experiences like that, spiritual experiences. And all of a sudden their fear lifts. They start being in two worlds at once. They're being comforted by this other world and these otherworldly experiences. And they're not as afraid anymore. And they get quiet. They, they turn inward because they are focusing elsewhere than in their physical body. And so initially, yes, there is a fear. Um, I imagine that every person who hears the news of a terminal illness has initially a fear. They're not ready to go, perhaps. But right before, there seems to be this peace that comes over them and that everything is okay as they start to have these spiritual experiences. Um, I would also like to share that it has been my experience so far when I'm sitting with my patients that when they take their final breath, they're actually standing outside their body. And I know that sounds out there a little bit, but the body, like a vehicle, the, the soul gets into it or the soul uses it, uh, blends with it. And some people take it fast, some people take it slow, some people take it in for regular maintenance, some people run it into the ground. It doesn't matter. When the vehicle starts to putter out, we don't have to just sit in the vehicle. We can step out of it and watch it coast to a stop. 
So while the body is shutting down and returning to the earth and what appears to be suffering by people who are observing and witnessing it, the watching their loved one take their final breath, they're already standing with us observing their body. And that has, I, I recently told that story to someone else and they said, oh, well, that's supported by near-death experiencers who in the hospital pop out of their body so they don't have to experience the trauma of CPR and chest compressions and all these things. And then they go back into their body whenever the body's no longer in its traumatic state. So I, I don't know. I think that there's something to that. I think that death is probably easy. I don't think it's very painful in the moment. And I don't think that unless our soul really wants to experience that final breath, there's no need. And the soul pops out and is feeling I tell you what, the feeling I feel when they're stepping out of their bodies is huge. I feel expansive. I feel bigger than the room. I feel an unconditional love for that person that I may not even know them very well. I just feel like no matter what they did in their life, I loved them for all of it. And it's the most beautiful experience. So um, yes, with the, <laughs> with the dying process, there is some fear beforehand, but ultimately it ends up okay. It's interesting that you brought up how you feel in the moment when you are with a client or a patient who's transitioning. Cause I was going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you, what are the energetics of the room? What does it feel like? Can you still sense the person? Like is, you know, as essentially is there an energy shift when that person takes their last breath? And I guess you, you did answer. I don't know if you want to expand on that even more, but I, I'm, I'm just curious to know more if you have more to share on that. For me, I become very much aware of, of my patient leaving the body, returning to the body, leaving the body hours before they actually take their final breath. But when it's your loved one and you're there, you are, you have already started the grieving process. You're heartbroken that this person is leaving physically and you're going to miss their hugs and their kisses and their phone calls. And so it is much harder for someone to, unless they've been practicing, I think, to tune into their loved one who's outside the body when they're so all just wrapped up in their own grief of the loss of that loved one. As a third party person coming in, I am much, it's much easier for me to witness this because I don't have that heart connection to them the way their loved ones do. But once they step out, I feel so much love. It is, you know, it's the most beautiful experience. So I, yes. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting that you said that you've been getting dates from spirit, you know, telling you when someone's going to transition. How does that make you feel? Do you share that with the clients and or does it like are you just like, oh, OK, cool. Now, now I can kind of get my affairs in order and, and make sure that things are aligned for that date. OK. This is interesting because it's a work in progress with me. Uh, when I first started getting um, premonitions of people's death and I would journal it um, from my team and spirit, I thought, oh, am I supposed to stop it? Am I supposed to, you know, tell the person and we, we shift it and change it? You know, I didn't know what that meant. Um, and it weighed heavily on me. And I have family members like my grandmother, uh, Grandmom Sylvia. She said, if you ever get anything on me, you need to tell me. Well, I did get something on her. And I said, you have two and a half years. And she was like shocked because let me tell you, she was, you know, in her eighties ballroom dancing, doing competitions. She in no way had two and a half years. Like she, she had, she thought she had at least in their decade. So that was a shock to her. And she did die with, you know, around her two and a half year mark. And, um, I then questioned, did by me telling her, did I manifest it? Did she then focus on it and create it? So then I struggled with that a little bit. But what my team and spirit has led me to believe at this point is that I don't get some kind of, you know, grand information about when someone's going to die. When a soul has made the choice to die, a soul on a soul level, not necessarily the personality, but when the soul has made the choice then I'm able to read that wave or a packet of information that's coming in. So it isn't that I'm like, oh, I'm getting some kind of information that this person is, you know, now I know it's based on their choices so far because every soul chooses 
how and when they're going to die to some degree, a large degree, actually. And I'm only picking up on what has already been chosen. So I have a few family members right now that I have journaled their deaths, but they've already told me, don't tell me if I know anything. And so I, I'm, I'm zipped, you know, but I have it in my journals. That, I mean, I don't want to project, but that must be hard. It's one thing to get dates for clients. I guess it's another thing to get potential timelines for family members, right? Um, I mean, again, I don't want to project, but that I would be like, oof, I, I don't want to know that, especially when it's someone that I'm super close to. And I do like what you said about the information not being this like, oh, out of the blue, like grand information, but information that on a soul level, the person already knows because people say that we choose when and how we're going to pass, which I guess for a lot of people, that's even hard for them to wrap their head around. But I've heard quite a few people say that, oh, the soul knows when they're going to leave. They they already chose that, right? Obviously, when you're in the physical body, you don't remember that, but it's kind of like you're picking up on the timeline the soul has already chosen for themselves. But again, um, I want on to this, know- that, On this timeline, yes. On this timeline, right? Because, yes. you know- <laughs> They're different timelines. <laughs> yeah. we, we get into the multiverse and parallel universes and all of that stuff. And people can hop timelines and switch outcomes. Yes. So the, the future is a moving target. So yes, yes. I, I understand what you're saying. But when you get that those dates for family members, are these family members older, right? Are they younger family members? Or like, how do you process it when it's when when these people are so directly connected to you? Or can you just pick up anyone's sort of deadline, <laughs> deadline. <laughs> no pun intended <laughs> that's funny um so I have uh picked up on the death of family members as as um young as 30 as old as 80s so um <clears throat> and in between um some have happened some have not many have already happened but some have not and um, it is actually hard. When I first get that wave of information, it just it like the last one I, I had was two months ago. I got the information that's four years out. I was cooking spaghetti and it was just a wave of information. It just hit me like a just whoosh washed over me. So it wasn't like I was in a meditation asking. Um, but um, now I know and I will take steps with my loved one to um, because I already know they don't want to know. So I will take steps with my loved one to make sure that they're doing everything they've ever wanted to do, that if they have any regrets, that I encourage them to be vulnerable and and speak what they need to speak in a kind, loving way um, for them to recognize where they are, where they want to go over the next handful of years. And um, yeah, so I am privately working with that. I have told one person, my husband, and uh, I know he's not a very spiritual person, though. I think in the back of his mind, he's just like, well, maybe not, but it's just, you know, you know, we all can hope that. Right. But at the same time, death is not a terrible thing. It's not, um, tell that to someone who's losing a loved one. I know, but, um, it's not the final goodbye. It's a see you later sort of thing. And so my team and spirit, and maybe because I'm working with the dying community really try to drive home for me that this is not the worst thing ever. Death is not death. Dying is easy. So, um, yeah. You know, that makes me want to ask you this question that came to my mind. And it's, you know, with all the clients that you've had, right, has there been any moment where you yourself kind of really struggled with the loss of the person where it was, it was heavier than usual? And, you know, if, if you want to share that and why was it so heavy for you, if you've experienced that? So probably my most beloved patient would be Mr. A, Mr. Arjuna. Obviously, I'm changing their names up, but to respect their family's privacy. But Mr. A was on hospice for five years, and I worked with him for four of them. And so I grew to love him so much. I was seeing him a few times a week for four years. He was um, very, very frail. 
And he also was very spiritual and had moments of um, psychic awareness and things like that. So that was always exciting too, because not a lot of people want to share those kind of experiences. So he was just so much fun and we would debate and also on, on religions. He was raised Hindu, uh, then became sort of agnostic throughout the majority of his life. And then right there at the end, in the last year, he chose to return back to Hinduism. And so we, we recognized and honored his faith. Actually, that's an interesting story too, because, um, he started seeing his deceased wife the last year of his life. And that was very distressing for him because he had gone back to accepting Hinduism as his faith. And his wife had transitioned 30 years before he did. And in the Hinduism religious belief system, she should have already reincarnated. Time is linear. She should have already reincarnated and already been living her new life. Um, the time had already passed for, for her. And so it was very distressing. Why is she here with me? You know, this goes against what we believe. And so we had to had to work through uh, that with him um, while continuing to support and respect his religious beliefs. So there are challenges like that that sometimes come up. But losing him was hard for me. And actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to share something too. I was worried he was going to take his last breath um, while I was away. And I was at that time still under the misconception that I needed to be there for the last breath. That's no longer an issue. You can hold vigil from anywhere in the world. But at the time I thought it was important and my team and spirit came through and they said, you don't have to be there for his last breath, but what you can do is you can send him a love letter. And I'm a very visual person. And so my love letter was um, a waterfall, this lush greenery, these bright blue skies, this perfect landscape that I knew Mr. A would love. And I just envisioned it in my head. And I took all that love I felt for him and all my hopes for him to have a peaceful transition. And I just kind of infused it in with that image and thought in my mind. And then I just said, okay, I'm leaving that love letter energetically for him to receive whenever he transitions. And my team and spirit said, leaving that amount of love and that love letter for him, even though it's a mental love letter, um, sort of lifts him up. And I don't know how. I still don't have an answer uh, from a team on what that means, how it lifts them up in the spirit world in some manner. But um, so now I send love letters to all my patients. I send love letters to all my family, to a guy who looks like he's struggling to get up the hill on that bike. I don't know. I leave love letters. <laughs> I have a long wake of love letters behind me. Um, but I encourage anyone to leave to leave love letters for for anyone. You mentioned that he was getting visitations from his wife. Why was she appearing to him? Did you, did you get any insight on that? Because I know it was yes. distressing for him at first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he liked seeing her. It gave him hope that there was that there was uh, that his belief was real that there's an afterlife that there's something more than this physical life so in that way it was reassuring um once we worked through we we tried all sorts of things i i think what we initially settled on was that perhaps she was a vision the way um humans throughout hindu history have received visions from the god or god and um or one god manifesting as many deities but uh, so maybe she was a vision. And if there, if she is a vision, then that means that gods and deities are real. And that means there is an afterlife. And that was reassuring for him in that way. So we, we approached it from that perspective. I also had a, a Catholic nun transition, um, Sister Bernadette, and she was distressed. I had come in um, and she told me she wanted to make a confession, but not to a priest. And she told me that uh, she had a sister from her convent visiting her, Sister Mary Catherine. And I was like, oh, that's nice, you know, make him small talk. And she goes, you don't understand. She's already deceased. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that gets me excited. I love spiritual bedside experiences. And she goes, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm Catholic, like devout Catholic. She's a nun. Um, I can't commune with the dead. And I said, well, you commune with the dead all the time. You talk to Jesus, you talk to God, you talk to Mother Mary. And she goes, no, 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 I, I pray to them. I don't commune with them. I'm not having a conversation with them. I, you know, can be thankful to them or ask them for something, but I'm not conversing. So um, I was like, oh, okay. 
Well, I was trying to figure out a way to handle that. I said, um, I think what we ultimately came upon was the idea that Mother Mary was visited by Archangel Gabriel um, and who told her she was going to be having Jesus, right? So I went with that route and I said, maybe you're having a vision of Mary Catherine, Sister Mary Catherine. And she was just like, okay, let me like, let me think about this. I think she said, bless you child, I'll think about that. But it was like trying to navigate someone's religious beliefs when it is contradicted by spirit showing up at the at bedside is so much fun, but it is challenging at times to kind of try to figure out how it fits into what they're willing to accept so that it becomes a joy and less of a distressing moment. Well, I just love what you just said, those two examples, actually, because I, I think it, it speaks to what you're talking about, that compassion piece, right? Because automatically, as you're telling these stories, I'm thinking, well, this is a perfect time to tell her that, you know, that's perfectly normal, right? And even though as a Catholic, you know, it's wrong to commune with the dead or it's evil or could be portrayed as evil. Well, actually, it's not evil and kind of give her a quick lesson. But then hearing your approach, I'm like, well, you know what, that's much better. Um, because that's probably a way better approach than the one I would have, that I would, than the one I would have taken if I was in that situation, right? So I really love that you're like, okay, you know, like you're, you're trying to make them as calm as possible and still kind of give them an analogy that will, you know, help put them at peace, right? Especially at this time, right? To keep them in that calm, loving frequency so that they can receive those visitations from spirits, right? And and feel the love that's coming from those spirits, I assume, um, yes. rather than feel rather than judge the situation or be afraid, right? Because who knows what they're going to experience on the other side, but at least maybe the first couple of seconds after they transition, they don't, you know, have like a scary experience based on any sort of fears that they're holding on to. So I actually love that approach because <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> well, I would have been not... like, <laughs> well, Sorry, I wouldn't be planning on converting a nun in her last final <laughs> hours on earth. <laughs> yeah, maybe but... don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, meet her where she's at. And then, you know, what? who knows? What if I'm wrong? You know, but it's just, you know, that would be me pushing what I believe or what my experiences are. And she did tell me, because uh, we met many times, but that she was aware of the um, sort of contradictions or hypocrisies in her faith. But she really valued the structure and she thought the good outweighed the bad of her religion. So she found, she was not, you know, she's not an idiot. She know She understands that there are, things in the Bible necessarily that didn't fully resonate with her, but she accepted the whole truth for her. And that was her truth. So um, yeah, I met her where she's at and we try to take it from there to bring the greatest amount of peace. Yeah. And I love that because, um, you know, when I think about religion and people have different belief systems and people have different things that work for them. And I, I refrain from putting things in, this is good. This is bad. This is, this makes sense. This doesn't make sense because, you know, depending on where people are or what they resonate with, that's yeah. what works for them. Right. So I, I don't know if you're subscribed to a particular religion, but I don't I don't know if you've given thought to religion and religious beliefs and practices based on the work that you do and the the people you come across who have pretty strong religious beliefs that play into how they view what is happening with them. So I have a master's degree in world religions, and I actually think that that has played a pretty big role in my understanding of of, of working with people through their religious beliefs at, at end of life. Um, I try not to, or with the help of a team, because they remind me, because I am still human. <laughs> um, they remind me to not put, try to put everything in a box, to not try to when I, when I try to say, oh, this must be this type of religion, this is true for me, I always like to say, this is my experience so far, because that can change tomorrow whenever I go and work with someone else and I have another experience. So it's really just my own experiences. And I, I hope that that keeps me open-minded and aware that this amazing world that we get to co-create is limitless. And I don't want to box it into a religion. I can just say my experience is so far. Um, and I have had experiences where I'm like, oh, this is it. I'm supposed to stop these people from dying. That's why I'm getting these premonitions. Nope, nope, that wasn't true. You know, so my experience so far is, for example, that I'm supposed to, 
I might have a ballpark so I can help aid in their peaceful transition, but not so much to stop it. That's not my place. So I'm learning just based on experiences. Of I'm course. still learning. I'll always be learning. <laughs> of course, it's a lifelong journey. And speaking of religion, one of the biggest things that come out of religion, that's a heavy topic for, pe for a lot of people, especially as it pertains to the afterlife, right? Transitioning from the physical body is the notion of heaven and hell, right? So have you received any hits from the A-team um, or just, you know, from you reflecting your own intuition into what heaven is, right? Like, are, are people actually going to a heaven? Does a hell exist? I don't know if you've gotten any sort of messages or guidance on that from spirit. Actually, that is a question. Both those questions are in my frequently asked questions at the back of the book. Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? So yes, I have actually um, asked a team, used my own intuition and used the information of people as they were transitioning based on their experiences. So um, when I sit with people and even their loved ones come through, so I guess it'd be doing a little bit of mediumship work as well. I have never once, not one time so far, have I had a person come through and validate an existence of hell? In fact, it's the exact opposite. Um, they validate that, uh, for lack of a better word, a heaven. But I sort of think it's the same thing as across the veil or a space in between. Like it's just a different plane of existence where challenges are different than they are in the physical body. It doesn't mean that challenges don't exist, that you're going to live on a cloud eating all the candy you think you want to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and ice cream and all of that and playing a little tiny harp. It isn't like that. It's another way of being authentically connected without being weighted by the physical body or being focused in a physical body. So I think that that is a heaven. I think there's still things that we learn and grow and, and challenge us over there in different ways. Um, but I have never had a single soul come through and validate hell. Not yet. Okay. You mentioned challenges and, and my curiosity peaked because mm -hmm. like many people, I just think, okay, well here on earth is the challenge. And once you transition, no more challenges or very minimal challenges. Of course, you know, if, if we want to subscribe to the fact that each of us, our soul is on a journey and we might choose different paths of learning, right? So of course, part of learning comes with challenges but in general like when you think about the concept of heaven there's always this sense of like well you're free from the body there's just nothing but unconditional eternal love that you can just kind of swim in and just like cover yourself in so there are really no challenges unless you choose to reincarnate back into a physical plane of some sorts but you just mentioned that there, there are challenges on the other side, potentially, that are different from what we could fathom. Has spirit given you any insight onto what some of those challenges could be? Yes. Um, okay. So it is exactly how you ex <laughs> described, you know, your this feeling of unconditional love, you know, you're free from the... Um, what we would I probably consider suffering or physical pain um, in that way. So you're free from that focused reality. However, and you can go and, and have that heavenly moment for a little while, but at some point you're going to get a little bored and you're going to want to navigate another experience different from floating in unconditional love. And that's where the challenge is. So I'm told, and I don't know, um, obviously, but I'm told that at some point when we decide that we would like another physical experience. A team tells me that we're one life because this is where reincarnation comes in. Um, people are always talking about past lives and future lives. And, and A team's like, no, you're, you're one life having many experiences, right? So um, your past life is happening at the same time as your future life. Like you kind of like, I don't know, you're multi-dimensional or, or multifaceted and you kind of do it all at once. So when you decide you want to jump back in and have a new experience besides floating in your sea of unconditional love, because you're bored, <laughs> then you meet with other like-minded spirits or other soul members, and you start the process of where do I want to go from here? Do I want to go back to earth? Do I want to go to a different planet? Do I want to, those are where the challenges emerge, trying to make 
what you want to get out of an experience match with what someone else needs to get out of an experience and working together to form and co-create a new experience and then deciding to do it together and when's the best time. So those are fun challenges. Um, you're not going to get the physical pain and suffering the way we do here. Um, but it's still like a logistical thing to kind of figure out, like, where do I want to go from here? You know, where, how, what do I want to learn? What do I want to experience? So that type of challenge. Okay. You know, I've heard the concept that you talked about, about kind of we're, when we think about having different lives, it's like all of those lives are working at the same time. They're mm -hmm. like manifested at the same time, but it's such a difficult concept to think about, right? Because it's like, I'm currently Jumi in this life in 2024 in Northern Virginia, but maybe I'm Susan in 1850 right now as well mm -hmm. living in London you know what I mean like it's just so hard to think about because it's like because uh, how I think about it right is the soul the essence like moves from one host to the next or from one journey to the next but every time someone says that I now think about the soul as like if, if the soul was the my hand right and you see how I have different fingers but they're all part of go. my hand so it's kind of like each finger is like hooked up in into a different straw or cup or something right but it's there's one large soul but essences or fractions of those souls are in different buckets that's kind of how that's I think amazing. about it okay I love that okay that helps me kind of try to conceptualize it a little bit more and I know that like it's it, these things are always going to be very hard to fully grasp but I hope this also helps the listeners who are listening to this try to figure out like okay how could that potentially work right um okay. that's a great analogy okay thank you <laughs> I feel good about that okay so this is a heavy question for you but do you think about your own death and what you would want it to look like given the work that you do. Absolutely, I have. And when I sit with a team um, and I'm doing my meditations, um, meditation's a, well, a loaded word too. So if I'm just sitting to kind of channel or just tune into that higher wisdom that comes through me, I write it all down in the mornings. And they tell me that, uh, they've been telling me lately that I'm not long for this world. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? You know what I mean? Or they haven't given me a time frame, but is it because humans in general have a short life? See, that's where I want to go with it. Or is it that, you know, I'm on a, on a, I'm not going to make it to a hundred or I'm not going to make it to 80. I don't know. So I know that they have told me that several times and I'm just like, okay, what can I do today? That is something that I, what can I do free of regrets? What can I, you know, try to do if there's a big goal that I want to do, like writing my book was a big goal. Um, then what can I do every day to take steps to complete that? before it's too late. So even if you're not like, oh my gosh, my book is going to take two years. What if I don't have two years? Well, then you take steps every day just because it makes you feel good. You feel whole in it. And if you leave this world feeling whole and at peace, well, then that's a beautiful death. Mm -hmm. Well, see what I love about talking to you is first, I feel so peaceful, right? Because this is such a heavy topic. Um, and even asking you that question, I didn't sense a shift in your energy of like, <gasps> this is about me, like having to think about my death. So you just don't seem scared at all, right? Especially given the information that you receive. So yeah, I just, I, I'm very inspired by that to say the least. And you mentioned your book and, and I want to ask you about that, right? So again, for the listeners, um, Gretchen's book is called Healing Whispers from Spirit Guides, Bridging the Gap Between Life and the Afterlife with a Debt Doula's Wisdom. Why was it important for you to write this book? Why, why did you need to get it out at this time? Okay, that's a really good question because at the time um, I was told by a team to write it. I didn't feel a, a, like a qualified person to write a book. I don't. I didn't even know what I would write about. I woke up one June morning and I heard a voice tell me you're going to write a book. And I remember thinking, write a book? What would I even write about? And they just said, write what you know. Um, I have never wanted to write a book. That seems really time consuming. Um, and it was, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was really hard and, um, you know, it didn't like flow from me. Like I would expect you guys are telling me to write this book. Like, it better just flow and just get it all out there. Well, it didn't, I had to really think about it. Um, so 
I ended up referring to the journals that I'd already, I have all these journals of my patients. And I thought, you know, the most transformative experiences I'm having are at the bedside of my patients. And so, and also the teachings from A-Team. So when I wrote this book, I, I wrote about one chapter would be about what I've learned, like a, a small lesson that I've learned through this process and then a supporting story of one of my patients and then another lesson and a supporting story. And I end each chapter with a quote from 18 because they have such beautiful things that they share on universal love and on all sorts of things actually. But so I wrote that book because I was told to, and now I know the importance behind it. So for the last 20 years, a team has been pushing compassion, 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 which is like drilling it in. And now they're shifting it to connection. You're already on the connection path. You're a podcaster. So you're sitting here with people and you're connecting people and you're telling people stories and you're helping people to tell their stories and you're sharing your own stories. So you've already been on the connection path. So I've been on the compassion path and they're starting now with the book being finished to move me to the connection path. So that's what I'm starting to explore. And so I see the reasoning behind it now, but I didn't at the time. Connection. I think I love that you said that, right? And you captured exactly what I'm trying to do with this podcast. Um, part of one of the um, sub themes for this podcast as well is also compassion, especially as it pertains to people's belief systems and things that they're experiencing, because I'm a big believer in not putting things in a box. Mm -hmm. And I think what people used to consider more sci-fi and, you know, things that they would consider to be conspiracy theories, having these conversations, connecting with people give people the space to listen in on certain experiences and feel, oh, I'm not crazy. This is, this is normal. I can connect with spirit or I connect, I can connect with the higher power, God, the creator, whatever you want to call it in a way that I can be at peace with rather than judging myself for it. Or when I hear someone else's story about their journey and certain things they've overcome, then I myself can kind of have some sort of compassion or empathy yeah. towards that person. So I, I love that you said that. And I feel like at this time, because so many people are waking up, I believe that your book is going to aid in waking people up and getting more comfortable with um, after the afterlife and death. And part of the reason why I like talking about death is because the more you talk about death, the more you live, you live an intentional life. That's my personal belief, right? If you know that at some point by, by God's grace, the goal is that we live to a ripe age, right? Um, but if you know that life is fleeting and life is fast, right? Maybe you're going to have an appreciation for your friends and family a little bit more, even when they piss you off, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that has, again, I don't want to project, but that's one of the reasons why I love talking. I don't, let me not say love talking about death, but I think it's important to talk about it because it, I think it is a grounding force, right? And we take away the fear of it so that we can all not necessarily be thinking in the back of our head, look, I'm going to die tomorrow, but like you could be more intentional and you can be more fearless. So you talked about having transformational experiences um, at the bedside of your patients. And I'm sure we've kind of like touched on some of these throughout our conversation, but is there one particular transformation that really changed you in a way that you would like to share with the audience? And, and some of these transformational experiences I'm thinking about is I know that, for example, there are certain things I struggle to forgive because I just don't understand. But then I might hear uh, someone's story or I might connect with someone that all of a sudden I have a paradigm shift and I'm able to release and forgive people in my life. And that just changes my energy and the flow of my life force. So I, again, that's just my personal example, but are there any profound transformational experiences that you've had that have really impacted your life in a positive way? So, yes, I would say, um, and I mentioned this also in the book, um, I talk about shared death experiences and having the opportunity to experience those. That's whenever an observer, a witness who is not dying, actually goes partway into the spirit world with the person who is transitioning. And these experiences have completely changed me 
profoundly. It's validated um, my experiences that there is an afterlife. Um, but what I have found even more transformative is I've had patients as they transition and they're standing outside their bodies, take the time to teach me something. They're aware of my presence. And I loved when you were talking about the fingers and the different cups and our souls. Um, I have one patient, Mrs. Wilma, I will call her. Uh, Mrs. Wilma was a part of a program called NODA, which stands for No One Dies Alone. And she was she was dying alone. <laughs> she was a Black woman in her late 80s. And she... She was dying because she was dying alone because her family could not afford to travel and to be with her. It wasn't that she didn't have any family, but they, um, so as I'm sitting with her and I'm holding her hand and I start the process of, you know, going inward and connecting to her, it could be what you could call a prayer or an intention. And I'm sitting there with her and all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye, a little girl walks in the room and she's in black and white. So when I see spirit in black and white, it's usually puts them in a time frame of 1920s to 1970s respectively. And so I knew it was young Mrs. Wilma of of age 10 or 12 years old. Her hair was twisted in little pigtails. She had on black like sh black shoes with like little white socks and um a white dress. It was like her Sunday best, you know, and she's like 10 or 12. And I had this overwhelming sense of segregation. And this was important because Mrs. Wilma was dying alone and she had this overarching theme her entire life of being separated, separated through segregation as a child and then separated from for her family and dying alone now in the, in the final stages. So she actually walked over and took my other hand. So I, I am aware that I'm holding Mrs. Wilma's hand with my left hand and she took my right hand. And when that happened, the hospital room that I was in transformed into a forest. And the story that she didn't use her mouth to talk, but it was like it was telepathic information. And she, it turned into this giant forest. And she told me we were going to scale this giant tree that we were standing now in front of. And we did. And when I got to the top, I could see full 360, even though I was only facing one direction. And she was telling me, I'm going to sum it up, but in the story, it's much more detailed. But basically, here's this one tree, this one life. It appears separate from that tree and that tree and that tree because we're in a forest. But this one tree has all these branches and all these branches appear separate from the tree. And every one of these branches have all these little tinier branches that appear separate from that branch. And all those tiny branches have leaves. And each one of those leaves leads separate little individual lives. So this whole tree is leaves on top of branches, on top of bigger branches attached to one tree. But this one tree is not standing alone. It's part of a larger forest. And she was really pushing the importance that we are all connected we are all one, even though we all individually appear to be leading separate lives, that we are never alone, that we are always connected. And this was such an important teaching to her because it contradicted the physical life that she had led. So I would say some of the most transformative experiences that I am having that have shifted my perspective on life and continue to every time I have them are shared death experiences where the patient is actually teaching me something before they actually move all the way over what a beautiful story with such beautiful imagery I felt I felt like I was lost in that story for a second just like picturing the forest and how amazing and, and what a gift honestly for you to be able to share in that experience right even like you called it a shared death experience and this is my first time hearing it but to be able to have that vision right and obviously that's a that was a knowing for her, but you're also able to share in that experience and keep that for yourself in, in your own waking world. And as you move through life and again, it kind of touches very nicely on the theme that you talked about, about connection and spirit kind of mm -hmm. pushing you more and more into that. And I don't believe in coincidences. So I, I believe, you know, someone could say you having that experience kind of like, again, is, is it's part of the synchronicity towards connection and understanding what connection is and, and how it really works and being able to communicate that to the rest of us listening to you and the rest of us who are going to read your book. So thank you for sharing such a beautiful story. Um, 
Would you mind uh, if I added one more thing? Yes, please. Okay. Um, real quick. I just, for anyone who's listening to what it would feel like to have a shared death experience, um, it would be as if I asked you right now, what, wherever you're sitting, to close your eyes and imagine the beach. And you could hear the waves rushing on the shore. You could feel the sand beneath your toes. And you could hear the cry of the seagull and feel the wind on your skin. And it feels like a memory. It feels like a thought just like right there, like right on the tip of your tongue. It's right there. So it isn't like this big boom, all of a sudden you're standing in a forest, you know, you're still very much aware that you're sitting in a hospital room, but it's also happening overlaid like a memory, like imagining a beach. So if you're sitting here right now looking at me, but also imagining a beach, it's like that, but a little bit more intense. So it's, it is something that someone who maybe didn't believe in this could easily dismiss it. And I just want people to not be dismissive, to be open to those beautiful experiences because they grow and get more intense as you allow yourself to open to them. Thank you for sharing that. I've had a couple of different, um, I've had a couple of different conversations with people recently that have talked about mystical experiences, but they're very similar to near death experiences, right? Because like you're you're calling this a shared death experience. People have near death experiences. Some people have mystical experiences. And when you look at the the experiences and what they're describing, they all kind of sound similar. Like you're all able to tap into this dimension that is not necessarily of this world, right? And through different sort of imagery and feelings and sensations. So I appreciate you for kind of going the extra mile to describe what that could look like so that people are not dismissive to it. Though I believe that the audience is very open to the things that we're sharing. Um, but I think it's always important to kind of make it more, explain it in a more bare bones kind of fashion. But like all of these things are very similar to one another, right? And they have they're triggered by different things. Some people it's during meditation. Some people have a traumatic experience. And right now, like that was triggered for you in your work as a death doula with your patient. Um, do your, I, I don't know if patient is the right word for, for your clients. I don't know if they're interchangeable, but let me know. Cause I've been saying going back be, between clients and patients and you're not necessarily a nurse, but I just want to make sure that I'm not using the wrong wording or maybe it doesn't matter but do you ever get visits from clients who've passed on like and they come visit you after a year or two just to like pop in and say hi because you were such an important part of their journey especially towards the end of their life really the end of their story I've had Mr. A come back and I had a reading done by a medium who brought in Mr. A for me um which I wasn't expecting um but I loved it and um the one of the reasons that I knew, for example, that Mrs. Julie had passed was because she appeared in my car and um, sat next to me when I was running errands. And I was like, oh, OK. So then I called um, the nursing home and they confirmed that she had just transitioned. So they do appear um, like Miss Julie did, for example, right beside me with this. She gave me this feeling of just gratitude, this overwhelming sense of gratitude. And uh, her story is also beautiful. It was She was she was lovely. Um, but they have, as far as like, do they pop in a year later? Um, only Mr. A, um, but the other yeah. ones usually happen right after. Okay. And when you say they, they appeared next to you, right? Can you mm -hmm. see them physic? I mean, I know you can't touch them cause they're spirit, right? But do you, do you see them physically or do you sense their essence? Like, what does, what does that look like for you? Like, is it actually an image or more of like a feeling and a and a vision in your mind. Yes. So objective would be if I were seeing it with my own physical rods and cones and my physical eyes in my in my physical focus. But I saw her subjectively, which would be in my mind's eye. But I just happened to turn my head and I took a double take because in my head it was like a projection of there she was sitting on my seat. And I was like, <gasps> you know, I was going to go see her later on this afternoon. I don't guess I'm going, you know, <laughs> it's like she's already here. Um, and then the feeling comes along with it, this love, but this, for her, it was so much gratitude. This, this just like, like she thought of me as a dear friend, um, which was just so moving. 
And so, um, yeah, so it was subjective. I didn't see her as if she were a part of my car. I saw her as if I were remembering the beach and there it was on my seat. Yes. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I have to ask, right, because we've talked so much about the afterlife and with the work that you do, why have you come to a conclusion or a knowing of why we're here, right? And I know the standard answer is like, we're here to learn and all that stuff and go on a journey. But if that's where you are, that's fine. And you can expand on it. But ha have have you given much thought to why we're here or has spirit kind of given you insight as to what the purpose of this reality is? So I think that we are multi-purpose. I don't think it's a singular um, concept that we're all here to do at all. I think that that as souls who have had many experiences in many bodies, probably on many different planets, on many different dimensions and planes, that we come with different smaller reasons for why we are here. But on a grander scale, I think it, um, I guess let's just talk about the human collective scale. Let's just talk about planet Earth. We'll narrow it down there. I think a lot of us are here to um, help the human collective. Because remember, while we are utilizing human collective and earthly bodies, we're actually so much more than that. But we are here to help the human collective evolve into knowing more of itself. So recognizing the truth of who we are, that we are multidimensional, that we, this is one fragment of who we are. And we get we do that by coming here and just being, being present in the now and experiencing the good and the bad, even though I don't like the word good and bad either, because really it's all good. But, you know, things that are um, joyous, the anger, the pain, the hurt, all those great things that maybe we don't get to experience in other places, all of it all combined into one big soup. We get to do this. That's what A-Team tells me all the time. Wow, you get to do this, which I don't like to hear when I'm specifically angry. <laughs> but they're like, wow, take it in. You get to be angry. Um, so um, I think that's part of it. I think we're here just to be and experience in all of its just joyous wonderment and with smaller little missions for ourselves that we want to learn, but to help evolve the human collective as a whole into a little bit more self-realization. So there's something you mentioned in the book. Um, it's called the 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 science club, right? <laughs> which is which deals with the exploration of spirituality and the afterlife. What what is the science club? Because I'm like, is this is this something that schools should create <laughs> and, oh and my like gosh. study, <laughs> or this is just kind of like uh, this is something else? Like, could you explain on what that is? Sure. Okay, so I was going into the closet, which in my house was the quietest room at the time, <laughs> to go sit and do a meditation. I was attempting to connect to A-Team because I wanted to ask them some questions about better understanding time and linear time and all the dimensions of time. Like, just that little old question, no big deal. <laughs> but <laughs> I went in there to ask that with the intention of asking A-Team that question, and then a man appeared in my closet. Now, he appeared to me as if the same way Miss Julie appeared in my car, the same way the hospital room transformed into the forest. It was in my mind, but very detailed. So, um, and it like overlays over my closet, my clothes. So the the gentleman um, was British because we're having a conversation and I saw what he looked like, the little mustache, the dark hair, his legs are crossed. Like we had, a, I, I journaled all of this stuff. And afterwards, I couldn't hear his name. And then afterwards, I went and I looked him up um, and I found his picture. Okay, so keep in mind that I am an art history and theology major. I never took any phys physics classes. I maybe took a physics class in, in high school because I remember the poster saying physics is fun, you know, <laughs> like, but um, I'm not a physicist and I have no interest, but uh, his name was Paul Dirac. I didn't know who he was even after I looked him up. But it turns out he was kind of a big deal, like um, buddies with Einstein and like contributed to physics in a way that he earned a Nobel Prize with uh, Schrodinger, the guy who's like Schrodinger's cat. See, I can't even tell you what it's about. Okay, so <laughs> like, um, so there he was, Paul Dirac. And so um, he came with a group of other physicists who were deceased. And one guy who wasn't a physicist, he's a biologist whose name is Kurt Hofer, and he just died in the last few years. 
didn't even know him, but he was some biologist in um, Florida. So again, don't know any of these people. Um, and I started writing down what they were telling me and they were giving me homework assignments. And so I just kind of grouped them all in because there was always new members being introduced and um, I just call them science club. And so what they're doing is they're giving me um, information that I don't believe is new to the physics community, but it's new to me. So then I can go look it up and validate it. So it gives me more trust in my own uh, spirit team that I'm working with. And in addition to that, they're helping me to link. Oh, I mean, it's so hard. It goes over my head. Let me tell you, I can read it 10 times on, on the internet and it's still, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know, but uh, they're trying to help <laughs> how it relates to spirituality. So um, they're trying to combine physics and spirituality to help me understand um, maybe so I can reach people on a more logical way. I'm sure it's for a greater purpose. It's not just for my own, you know, try to teach me physics. No, I'm beyond that. I, I don't want to know physics. <laughs> like that. So, um, but they, um, they come in, they give me a, a few lessons. I have journaled all of that and I have it included in the book under science club. Um, I almost didn't include it. My husband, who's not spiritual, but very logical. It's his favorite part. He, that's, he wanted me to include that. And I can read it like 10 times. And I'm like, I don't even know what I wrote. Like it's, it's out there. There are a few things that I could not validate, but I left them in because maybe one day they'll be validated. One of them is platonic. Hold on. Platonic waves. Because I think platonic solids exist and platonic waves don't. So I left him in there as part of what they were talking about, platonic waves, um, just so I can keep it all. But, you know, yeah, that's science club. I, I just don't think that you can put mathematics and science in one bucket and put spirituality in some of these exactly. supernatural phenomenon in a different bucket because we're spiritual beings having a human experience and everything is interconnected and that's why like quantum computing ai quantum physics these are like hot button topics that people are like racing to figure out racing to understand so i think the spiritual community and the science community might start to collaborate more in the future um and it's fascinating right because we already have people who study near-death experiences right and like look at it from a spiritual perspective but also look at it from like a science perspective right because you have doctors yeah. um and researchers and and you know academics who are heavily studying that subject so very 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 fascinating thank you so much Gretchen for stopping by shifting dimensions I have to ask you I ask all my guests have you shifted in perspective on anything recently and it could be lighthearted. maybe you discovered a new food or started you know doing something that you never thought you'd be interested in doing or it could be as deep as you want it to be um I am shifting in perspective yes uh maybe a week or two ago so very recently I suppose um my team and spirit a team is having me it's helping me to consider doing verbal channeling. So before I would write it down, I would basically like be a, an assistant. I would just be, they dictate to me and I'd write it all down. So now I am attempting and I have a nice group of ladies who are so patient with me while I sit and try to practice verbal channeling. And it, I was so terrified to do it because I don't want to have like a weird voice. Hello. You know, like sometimes you hear people with weird voices when they channel. So I didn't want to do that. Luckily, everything came out on the conscious channel. So it came out in my own voice, which was what I was happy with. But um, <laughs> so my, my perspective shift is that I am going to trust spirit and allow the verbal channel to come through. <laughs> that is so funny. <laughs> um, I was on mute and cracking up, guys. Uh, so you probably didn't hear me laughing so much in the background. But yeah, that's so funny. And I have to ask, you know, because obviously this work that you're doing, I think is going to be super helpful to a lot of people. But also it comes with a lot of like judgment. Do you ever get worried about what people think about you channeling or talking about these things? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I do. And I yeah. didn't do it. My, I have a son who's 19. And so I, he's in college and I didn't do it for most of his life. My daughter's 13. And um, now I'm just like, well, I hope she's okay with it. Cause I have it on Facebook. I have, if any mom 
looks me up, you know, I worry about them saying, uh, you know, their kid can't play with my kid, that kind of thing. But really it's only that. But I have found since putting out this book, since telling people I was writing the book, which is being held accountable, is that stepping into who I am and owning who I am is um, I'm finding more and more people that I never would have thought were spiritual in any way or are spiritually in the closet will privately confide in me. Even my husband's friends will come up and say, you know, I've had an outer body experience, you know, I've, and so I'm just like, wow, okay, I am supposed to be putting it out there and sharing and normalizing spirituality and normalizing talking about death and just helping people to connect. You know, that's where a team's sending me next. So I think the more we can be vulnerable and trust that we're right where we're supposed to be and set aside those judgments, because I've had those fears for a long time. I'm just, I'm doing it. I'm setting it aside and I'm finding it's actually more good than, than bad coming from it. Definitely. Yes. And, you know, to the, to one of the themes that we talked about on the show is, you know, we have to be as authentic as possible and Yes. We don't want to look back and think, oh, I wish I did that thing, you know, so. That's right. You. I don't want to live like Mr. Robinson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much again. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you and pick up your book? The book is on Amazon. I, um, the audio book, the Kindle and the paperback copy. And my website is www.helengretchenjones.com. Awesome. I'm going to leave those links in the show notes. Thank you, Gretchen, for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. Thank you, Jimmy. It's been nice being here. <laughs>